You're listening to the really useful podcast. This is the tech podcast for technophobes from makeuseof.com. Welcome to the show. My name is Christian Corley, and in this week's really useful podcast, you will find the latest tech news that matters to you and the devices that you're using. And we've got some tips and tricks later on in the show. To kick things off, I'm going to be going through the news items that matter right now, flying solo this week. Uh, But a little bit later on, I'll be joined by Ben Stegner to go through some tips and tricks. Samsung's Fan Edition phones could be making a comeback with the Galaxy S23 FE. Um, Now, Fan Edition phones are kind of uh, flagship phones at a more acceptable price, shall we say. And Samsung could be about to revive this series of phones with the S23. Now, they kicked it off a few years ago with the Galaxy S20 FE, uh, a flagship level device at a more attractive price price point but then they skipped the s22 there's no fe for that and it looked as though samsung had given up on the idea basically but korean website hankuki.com reports that samsung will launch the galaxy s23 fe in august or september this year 2023 now judging by previous models we would expect it to use either the new snapdragon 8 gen 2 for galaxy chip or possibly the older gen 1 and include a slightly downgraded camera setup. It's suggested that Samsung is taking this route because there is no uh, mid-range or upper mid-range Galaxy A74 as expected. Now, this is the interesting thing about this. Some of Samsung's competitors are releasing phones with amazing cameras and other top-end specifications and features at mid-range prices. Now, a Galaxy A series phone, uh, you know, you're going to get a good phone with that. But I'm holding here, and I've mentioned it before on this podcast, the Oppo Reno 8 5G, Reno 8 Pro 5G, I beg your pardon, uh, a phone with an amazing camera with uh, AI technology to uh, enhance photography. I will link to the review of this phone in the show notes so you can uh, check it out. Uh, As I say, it's been mentioned before. I've been using it since mid-2022. And I wonder if it's phones like this are actually playing a part in Samsung bringing back the FE series of phones. As I say, fan edition phones are flagship devices at an attractive price point. That's essentially what this Oppo is. So, for example, a Samsung Galaxy S23 standard phone will cost you nearly $1,000, whereas the lower price point would be about $600, $700, mid-range above halfway to $1,000, shall we say. That's where the Oppo Reno 8 Pro sits. And similar phones with these high specs at a low price with just a few missing features that most people really don't need. But, you know, I can't really think of anything that's missing from this Oppo. I think Samsung are... uh, aware of certain manufacturers presenting top-end features at a lower price point to things like the Samsung Galaxy and a more affordable version also persuades people to stick with uh, Samsung Galaxy rather than go for an iPhone. Now we'll move on now to Instagram introducing what it's calling broadcast channels. Uh, They've been testing new broadcast channels for creators to interact with followers it's a one-to-many messaging channel which are being tested with a few u.s creators it's a feature announced by meta ceo mark zuckerberg a little bit more from him later on uh, february the 16th on his own broadcast channel the feature is meant to allow users to and i quote engage directly with their followers at scale this means that certain people that you follow on instagram will be able to communicate in a different way to other people certainly for the time being. So um, similar to other chats on Instagram, creators will be able to post text, photo, video, voice notes, and even polls on these channels. But as a one-to-many channel, only creators will be able to send messages. Meanwhile, followers can react to content and vote in polls. 
The initial rollout has been limited to US creators, but more features and users will be introduced in the coming months. Creators currently testing these channels include a whole list of people that you may or may not have heard of, such as Austin Sprints, Chloe Kim, David Allen, Michaela Schifrin, Tank Sinatra and Valkyrie. Now, it is a new way for creators to interact. It could flip the way that Instagram is used, not just by content creators, which, you know, it's an awful term, content. Creator isn't the best word to use using for someone who sort of makes something for a social media you know when you create something you put quite a bit of effort into it, a lot of heart and soul social media and, and and television as well and radio by definition are pretty disposable so uh, strange terms for strange times but it is likely to be something that changes how instagram is used now, if you are a creator interested in joining the channel test, you can sign up for an Instagram broadcast channels waitlist place. Uh, we will include the link to that in the show notes, along with everything else discussed in this week's show. It's that man again, Mark Zuckerberg, who, like Twitter, is planning a paid verification badge for users. I feel as if maybe he's misinterpreted how people use Facebook, but there you go. And this is for Facebook. This isn't for Instagram. This is for Facebook. On the 19th of February, Mark Zuckerberg announced on his Facebook page the following. Good morning and new product announcement. This week we're starting to roll out Meta Verified, a subscription service that lets you verify your account with a government ID, get a blue badge, get extra impersonation protection against accounts claiming to be you, and get direct access to customer support. This new feature is about increasing authenticity, little pause there, and security, again, across our services. Meta Verified starts at $11.99 a month on web or $14.99 a month on iOS will be rolling out in Australia and New Zealand this week and more countries soon. Now, this has got a whole load of unpacking to do and really it's the sort of thing that I want to be talking to Gavin or Ben with. That final bit for start off, Australia and New Zealand. I'm not sure if they suffered enough over the past few years, but just back up a little bit to eleven ninety nine a month on web or fourteen ninety nine a month on iOS, so presumably that's the uh, iPhone and iPad app. There isn't an Android version of this yet, presumably. What, why are iPhone and iPad users paying more for this quote-unquote feature? This is utterly... I feel it's deranged, if I'm honest. It was confirmed a few hours later, and Zuckerberg says the new feature is about increasing authenticity and security across our services. Again, unpacking that... I mean, they could hardly decrease authenticity and particularly security and privacy. I, I find this an utterly deranged attempt to just make money on a service where people already are the product, the adverts that hit your feed on Facebook, promoted posts, sponsored posts. Now you're expected to pay for those. There's no mention in this list of no adverts. Okay. Now, to clarify, Meta Verified will allow users on both Instagram and Facebook to get that verification badge. So it's across Meta, as the name suggests. But as I say, adverts everywhere on both services, no attempt, no idea, no suggestion, even that you'll get less adverts. So you're paying for adverts if you go with Meta Verified. Uh, frankly, I can't see it taking off. There's not, not enough benefits there. Just re recap those benefits. Ver a verified badge. Ooh. Impersonation monitoring. Customer support. Prioritization in comments. Recommendations in Instagram Explore and Reels. And exclusive stickers for Instagram Stories. Uh, unless you are already a hashtag, quote unquote, content creator. Um... I really don't see this being of any benefit to anyone. And it's, you know, there's a very strong possibility of this. I mean, it's going to create a two-tier uh, experience 
on Facebook and Instagram, and I can't see that. I mean, Twitter Blue isn't anything special. It's not really working for most people. Most people who are using it aren't using the full features of it. They're basically paying for a blue tick. Paying for a blue tick? Pay, paying to be verified? Anyone can pay. Anyone can have that verification and that status. The features that accompany it just... And its limitations with the platform, of course, mean that the features can't really be that impressive anyway. That's, I mean, unless you've got a very special need to, I could not recommend paying for Meta, Verified, or Twitter Blue, or anything like that. Okay, it's time for the tips and tricks in this week's really useful podcast. Now, I'm a big fan of using a VPN. It doesn't really matter whether you use it for watching Netflix or whether you watch it for, yeah, use it for maybe uh, working from home purposes or if you use a VPN for getting a better price on your flights. You should have one installed on your computer, um, a subscription with a VPN provider, and you should be using it pretty much all of the time unless you're using a website which won't accept it, such as some banks won't accept connections over VPN. Uh, now, that said, VPNs have become a lot more affordable and available over the past few years and they've become even more private in fact i would say that i've had a look into this and i've established 10 ways in which vpns have become more private well, i'm going to give you a summary of them now and then ben's going to pick my brains about one of them okay? okay so number one logless servers have become a thing uh, there was a time when VPNs would just record everything, um, but that's not very private. And if a, v a VPN is uh, recording everything, then they're subject to subpoenas and other uh, legal uh, requests that they have to adhere to. So uh, logless services become a thing. Uh, there is improved encryption now. Um, one to eight bit AES has not been cracked in the real world. It may have been cracked in a lab, but it's it's not something that's uh, possible to crack uh, using. Uh, standard techniques even so we still we now have 256 bit AES encryption which uh, mathematically speaking will take longer to crack than the universe has been in existence <laughs> which is insane um discless will be in existence or has been has so been so far yes okay yeah. Uh, diskless servers are a thing. So basically the servers don't have a hard drive. They just have RAM. The The operating system boots over a network cable uh, from a remote a, a, a secondary server and is retained in RAM. And that, this means, you know, if, if the server goes down, all the information on it is gone. If a log requesting is, is made, the VPN company can switch off the server or the information will be lost. You know, just like when you turn off your PC and the information that was in the RAM is lost. Uh, DNS leak protection. Uh, DNS leaks was a thing that happened a lot uh, in the old days, and IP address leaks. We now have kill switches and other provisions which provide leak protection. Uh, basically, it means that if there's a leak, then when you connect to a VPN, uh, your data is been routed through a client app on your computer to a VPN server, and that data is encrypted. With DNS leak, information leaks out from the side, which isn't encrypted, and will give away your true location rather than the location that the server gives you. So that's a useful development. Um, private DNS enhances VPN privacy as well. And um, this means um, there's a thing called DNS, which is a sort of a telephone directory for the internet. So when you type in uh, www.makeuseof.com, that gets translated in a DNS to the IP address for make use of. And that's how DNS works. Now, there's um, many public DNSs, and they're now private DNSs, uh, which are encrypted, which is obviously makes things more private. Now, I mentioned the price of VPNs, and they're more affordable. Now, you might think, well, that's not that secure. But if you think about it, the price of VPNs has come down so much that everyone has the opportunity to be using a VPN, thereby everyone becomes more secure uh, online. Um, there's a thing called split tunneling as well, uh, which allows you to retain a com connection to your VPN while using apps that aren't using the VPN connection, which is really useful. VPNs uh, allow access to overseas Netflix libraries, which I mean, 
you might say, well, that's not particularly private, but perhaps you're not supposed to watch the content that's on that Netflix library if you live in a particular country. So it's kind of, I'm stretching it. All right, I know. Um, mm -hmm. There's a thing called double VPN as well. So if you need extra encryption, um, you can connect to a VPN server, which will then chain your connection to a second VPN server, which means there's two lots of 256-bit encryption taking place on your data. And to enhance your privacy pretty much across the board, you can install a VPN or set up a VPN subscription um, on almost any device, whether it's a mobile phone, a smart TV, um, your router, pretty much anything. I mean, I'm not sure about fridges and smart kettles, but, you know, one day, maybe. So, yeah, those are the ways that I've established VPNs have uh, evolved over the past decade. I think it's really good. It's really important that everyone has a VPN. And to be honest, I think we're getting closer to the point where, at the very least, um, DNSs will be encrypted. If everything, everyone doesn't have a VPN, at least we'll have the advantage of encrypted DNS. Yeah, I think when I, uh, when I moved and set up my own router and everything, I want to say... I forget which one I'm using. Uh, I think I'm using 1.1.1.1, which is, uh, let me see. What is it? it it's Cloudflare. Cloudflare. Yeah, DNS. I couldn't remember what it was. Yeah. Um, that I heard was pretty solid. I figured I'd rather use that than go with Google's. Um, but yeah, that's another important step too. Um, so I get what my overall thought after uh, going through all that, I, wh where would you like to see, uh, vpns go in the future like what what features do you think they're still lacking or would be cool to add uh, that would make them more private and uh, even a better a product than they already are i'm not really sure the problems with vpns now i think it might be with other devices specifically routers now there are some routers that you can get that you can install your own firmware on there and then you can configure a VPN connection f from whichever VPN that you're subscribed to. Similarly, there are routers that you can buy that are all ready for you to set up your VPN connection with. However, uh, internet providers will ship you a router, and you can't do pretty, you can't do anything with it in terms of VPNs. I would like to see an end to those routers. Every router, every user with a router should have the opportunity to set up a VPN on it. Yeah, like a right to install your own software yeah. on it kind of yeah, thing. Like the same thing with Android, where it was like, a you know, that they don't have like the bootloader locked permanently to where you can't install your own custom ROM on it or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, it is crazy, like you said, that with them becoming more ubiquitous, it's funny, not funny, but interesting how VPNs went from, you know, eight or 10 years ago where it was like, something that only business people who were traveling used or just people had no idea what it was. And it became more of like a, an everyday thing. Now to where you're hearing VPN ads on t TV and podcasts and things like that. Um, not, this though, that not this podcast though, not this podcast. No. Um, my worry is kind of that V like when I think about VPN overall, my worry with them is kind of, I think they've, they be, they become so ubiquitous that I think, it's almost sort of like security software, you know, how like we went from like security apps, like a vast being really solid and, and slim to just being like bloated and full of nonsense. Um, my worry with VPNs is that people think they're like, they're a one click, like you're totally anonymous forever, which yeah. these companies like to make it sound like, and it really isn't true. No. Um, so that's, that's my worry is that people think you're like, you know, totally erasing any trace of yourself like that's there's just way too many things that track you online for that to be practical oh yeah absolutely i mean like if you're going to uh, i mean if you're concerned about facebook uh using a vpn to then connect to facebook is absolutely pointless right because they already know who you are yeah you're um, signing kit, in so kit boga who i think i've talked about before uh maybe a couple of years ago he does like scam baiting videos uh where he you know, oh yes set up where he yeah, calls yeah. people who are tech support scammers and it's he's hilarious he does very elaborate things to them it's worth a watch um but he did a video not a not one of those videos on his youtube channel where he talked about like why vpns aren't the one click anonymity that they claim to be and whenever many options you know he said if you're if you're somewhere eating with your friends and you take a picture and you upload it like that data has that photo has location data in it that even if you're on a vpn like that's not going to change anything and like if or like if you use gmail like even though you're using a vpn there's still data in your gmail when you buy something like 
the, the shipping addresses in your email. So like Google doesn't think, oh, he just suddenly moved, you know, across the country or across the world. Like th there's other ways to show that yeah. you're not really where, you know, you're not suddenly in uh, Spain or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it is useful for privacy in very specific situations and scenarios, which I've, I allude to in that article and we've explained elsewhere on make use of, um, I, but you know, the best, the benefit that you're going to get from, from it is that, uh, and this is going back to the routers and the ISPs, they don't want you to have a VPN because they want to manage the traffic. Right. And they can't manage the traffic if they can't identify the traffic. It's called um, uh, traffic shaping. And if the traffic is encrypted, then they don't know what you're doing. So, which is why you get a better, why you can get a better internet speed from using a VPN because the traffic shaping is, um, is, isn't affecting you, basically. Um, but, you know, that's probably a conversation for another time. Okay, now, Say you've got an Android phone and you've got some media on it that you want to share with someone. Ah, this happens to me all the time. I go around my parents' house and there's a video that um, I haven't shared on Facebook because uh, I don't like sharing things on Facebook, really. My wife loves it, but I don't do it particularly. So I want to share it more privately with my parents. It's usually a video of my children. And um, it's not easy to do, especially with their TV. Um there are eight ways that you can share content on a phone, um, Android phone specifically, we're talking about here, um, either using USB or using wireless technology to a TV. I'm going to go through them quickly, and then we'll have a little chat about them. So number one, you can use Google Chromecast. Uh, you can cast from an Android phone to the Chromecast, and it'll play on the TV instantly. You can cast from Android TV uh, to Android TV from Android phone. Uh, Android TV has Chromecast built in. So as long as the Android TV is connected to the network, Chromecast will work and you can cast to it. You can mirror your screen to an Amazon Fire TV unless you're using some Samsung Galaxies which don't support mirroring. That's something it's an oddly specific uh, yeah, restriction. Yeah. Oh, I've had a lot of, I've wasted a lot of time trying to get that to work. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, you can stream to a TV over your network with a DLNA. Some TVs have DLNA, but more specifically, Blu-ray players, set-top boxes, games consoles, support digital living network alliance guidelines. It's something that's kind of being, not so much phased out, but being incorporated into other technologies now. So it's um, something that's m less specific than some of the others. You can connect a phone to an HDMI TV with a USB to HDMI cable. But this is, oh, this is one of the, my biggest bugbears at the moment. So when it comes to a phone with USB Type-C, the port has to support USB 3. Most Which phones... all chargers do, right? Yeah, exactly. Most phones with USB-C port support only have USB 2. And HDMI out over USB Type-C only works with USB 3. Um, curiously, though, older Android phones and tablets that had micro USB, a, a few of them, a few more of them than, than you would expect, you'd be surprised, they will do HDMI out. There are a few older phones with an HDMI port. Uh, we used to have one. Um, I was going to say, I think I remember that. Like, that's, yeah, that, that was kind of bizarre. Like yeah. The phones had that yeah. dedicated, like, in before today's world. Yeah. Um, as ever, everything that we discuss in the show is in the show notes. And this article has a photo of a phone that my wife owned, which was an LG something Optimus. And it had that little, that is it there with the HDMI output. It worked perfectly well. Um, but it's, it's something that kind of, I think it was around 2013, 2014. These phones existed, and it isn't a thing now, clearly. Um, you can connect your phone as a storage device to the TV using the USB port. Now, assuming it's a modern, rec relatively recent TV, that USB port should be open access and not limited to engineer use. So it should, and you, you know, your input select on your menu on the TV remote control should be able to switch to USB and uh, navigate through the uh, content on there. You can connect your Android phone to your TV using a Roku in much the same way as Amazon Fire and uh, Chromecast. Uh, you have to enable it in Roku first. And you can connect to a wireless-enabled TV with an Android phone uh, thanks to uh, Miracast technology, which is a bit like DLNA and is built into the TV. It's, it's basically wireless HDMI. So those are the ways that you can do it. And um, 
I mean, have you, have you tried any of these? I've been trying to do this recently. I should just say, now my Oppo, which I think is a wonderful phone, I've talked about it a few times on this podcast, and I reviewed it for make use of a, uh, a video review, and it's probably the best Android phone I've ever used. Uh, I enjoy using it, and I think it's important if you've got a phone, and it is a smartphone, and not some sort of like lollipop feature phone, or or even you know even more archaic. If you've got a smartphone, you should enjoy using it. And I really enjoy using the uh, Oppo uh, Reno8 Pro. But I have to say, it will not cast without crashing no the home. What? No, it will crash the home screen. And then I've got to rebuild the home screen, basically. It loses all the, all the icons, gone forever. And I don't know what the problem is. I'm assuming that there is an app on here that is stopping it from happening, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what's causing it. So, uh, yeah, I found that very, very frustrating. Uh, so twice it's happened recently, and I've had to then spend time rebuilding the home screen, you know, all your shortcuts. I keep my home screen very sort of minimal, so I basically um, swipe to the right to get the, the um, Google stuff, uh, you know, the, the latest links and stuff that I'm interested in reading. And yep, yep. Th- there's no... Sl- there's no swipe to the left everything else is in the app drawer the important things are on that single screen i don't have endless screens to scroll through because life's too short basically that used to be my approach on android too um like my main apps on one home screen with a couple folders but yeah i kept it pretty minimal as well i might have had some widgets on the other screen um but yeah that's, i think i agree I, I like that approach better um that's that's bizarre though i've never heard of like that kind of error when you're casting no one has apparently all your shortcuts away can you like back the home screen up at least i know some i've considered doing that i haven't yeah i thought about doing that i've looked into it there isn't anything built in which will let me do it i don't know if it's something that can be if there's apps that do it or not and the the annoying thing is i haven't been able to find anyone else on the internet who's had this problem so that's not good That's, that's that's bizarre it's one of those things where I've never heard of it, so I wouldn't even know how to diagnose it because I haven't heard those two problems being connected. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as my uh, experience with this, I've I've only really used like the easy methods, like opening up a YouTube video and tapping cast and sending it to your TV. Um, I've never used I've never used Android TV myself. Uh, I've never really. I think I might have used Miracast once or twice, but I, I kind of agree with you. It sounds great, but I feel like it's pretty wonky in practice. Like whenever I get it, it's like the computer doesn't want to play along or it's really choppy or just disconnects or something. Yeah. Um, I really like the, like the easy casting. Like it's really handy. Um, if you're just like in a hotel or something and you want to throw something up on the TV without having to like sign into your account and go through all that nonsense, like just being able to tap a few buttons and, and put it up is, uh, is handy for sure. So, but yeah, if it does, if you have something that doesn't work with any of that, it really is a headache. Yeah, definitely. So those are the ways that you can get videos, pictures, music, whatever, playing on your TV from an Android phone. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's really useful podcast. I've been Christian Corley. I was joined earlier by Ben Stegner. We're both from makeuseof.com. And this is the tech podcast for technophobes, which is designed to help you make better use out of your technology, out of the gadgets you own, the hardware you own, TVs, phones, computers, whatever. If there's anything you found useful in this show, please share it far and wide on your social media accounts, via email, whatever. And uh, if you've enjoyed it, please leave us a review, preferably on Apple Podcasts. We'll be back for a new show next week. Until then, enjoy the rest of your week. Take care and goodbye.